Whenever old Johnson hands get together, we delight in telling Johnson stories, sometimes the same ones over and over. All of us, at one time or another, have thought it a shame that this wealth of Johnson material could not somehow be preserved. And now it has been, a lot of it at least, under a project supported by the LBJ Foundation for the benefit of the LBJ Library, Bob Hardesty and Harry Middleton have collected on videotape the reminiscences of 76 persons comprising some 200 hours of priceless recollections. The entire collection will be an invaluable resource for Johnson researchers for decades to come. For this presentation, in the centennial year of President Johnson's birth, not all interviews could be used, of course, nor could any complete interview be included. But these excerpts present a sample of that treasure trove and an opportunity once more for all of us to revel in vintage Johnsonia. He was very much like my mother's older brother, my Uncle Ed. My Uncle Ed, back in South Carolina, was an irascible, difficult person who wanted to be irascible and difficult because when you're that way, people have to handle you. They have to placate you. They have to settle you down. And uh, it's a kind of wonderful thing for the ego to be irascible and to have everyone have to adjust to you. And I realized that this personality, this enormous, uh, the cliche was that he was larger than life, that his irascibility was in a way, um, a way of becoming the center of attention. And uh, I, I felt... The commanding officer wouldn't let LBJ sit at the head table because he said there's a war on and I don't want any politics. And here Johnson put the base out there. Uh, so he put Johnson out in the audience at one of the tables on the right-hand side, at the same table where Joe Kilgore and I were sitting, along with uh, uh, Buck Hood. And uh, uh, there was Johnson sitting in out there with a scowl on his face. They put uh, lawyer Ed Clark at the head table because Ed had been, uh, had been a member of the Texas National Guard, and therefore he was a soldier, and there'd be no politics, so he put Ed Clark at the head table, and he put Johnson out in the audience and made him sit out there because he wouldn't let Johnson sit at the Air Force that he had built because he didn't want any politics. And he, Johnson sat there and seized and kind of quietly raged about it and said to himself, and we looked at each other, and Johnson leaned over to me and he said, I'll tell you one thing, pointing to the commanding officer, that SOB will never make general. <laughs> to be in opposition uh, pretty much across the board in a responsible way in dealing with the Johnson administration. Now sometimes that was a little too strident, but when you're the leader you do have an obligation there. Uh, and Lyndon, on a couple of occasions, got quite irritated. He thought with my nitpicking, so to speak, and Lyndon had a thin skin on occasion. And I've forgotten the quote, but I think it was Jerry, nothing wrong with Jerry Ford except he played football too long without a helmet. <laughs> Bill Nolan was the minority leader when I first went up there. And I went in to uh, one time to, to talk to Johnson. And he said, you know, I just love Bill Nolan. He said, uh, just, just wonderful having him as, as minority leader. And I kind of, you know, this didn't quite sound like Johnson. I kind of he looked quizzical about it. And then he leaned over and said, because he's a goddamn dumb. <laughs> And then I said, oh, he said, I can beat him every time. You know? He never figures it out till it's too late. <laughs> so I heard him say once we had, we had a meeting with <clears throat> Whitney Young and, and uh, Roy Wilkins. 
and some of the civil rights leaders. And uh, they were talking about the liberals want this, the liberals want that. And Johnson bends over to Whitney Young and Roy Wilkins. He says, you know the difference between liberals and cannibals? He says, cannibals eat only their enemies. Will Sparks and I were, the, at this time, uh, the only full-time speechwriters in the White House. And uh, Bob Kentner, who had just left NBC as president, uh, was coming on board uh, the White House staff as a special assistant to the president, and the president wanted him to meet Will and me. So uh, he called us over, and uh, we sat there in the Oval Office, uh, the president in his rocker, and Will and me on one side, and, and uh, Bob Kintner and Jack Valenti on the other. Uh, Jack was leaving the White House, and Kintner was coming aboard. And the president was talking about various things and, and things that we did. And, and um, at one point he said, now Bob and Will are the best speechwriters any president has ever had. And I thought to myself, well, this, this is pretty heavy, heady stuff. And then he explained, they're not temperamental, they don't miss deadlines, and they don't get drunk the night before a major speech. And uh, he, he wanted to speak that day about the brevity of speeches. He said, now, take the number four. He said, now, you guys have all been to college. Can you count to four? One, two, three, four. Am I going too fast for you, Jack? Harry? No. He says, I want no speech should be more than four minutes long. No paragraph should be more than four sentences long. No sentence should have more than four words. And most words, in fact, all the important words, have four letters. Well, I thought of the four-letter words I know. And he said, take love and home and food and peace. He said, I know peace is five letters, but it should have four. In 1968, uh, after Martin Luther King uh, was assassinated and there were riots uh, in the uh, city of Washington, a lot of us were around the White House, maybe not totally around the clock, but uh, with fairly late hours. And uh, the president always wanted to know where everybody was. And Walt Rostow, who was the national security advisor, uh, had been there at the White House uh, for fairly late hours for two or three days and about six or seven o'clock one day he came to see me uh, as he was leaving and he said, Larry, uh, if the president uh, asks about me, I'll be back in a little bit. I'm going to go home. Uh, I haven't been home uh, in 48 hours. I think he had been at the White House around the clock. Uh, I'm going to go home and uh, have a uh, martini with uh, Elspeth, his wife, uh, and uh, maybe change my shirt and suit, uh, and then I'll be back down here. And uh, so I said, fine. And sure enough, LBJ inquired an hour or so later about him and said, where's Walt? And I said, well, Mr. President, uh, he's been here at the White House for about 48 hours straight. and." Uh, he said to tell you that he was going to go home and change his shirt and suit and uh, have a martini with Elspeth uh, and would be back. And uh, the president said, oh, poor Walt. I wish I would known if he'd have told me he could have had a drink with me. I remember one time John Kenneth Galbraith was in his office <clears throat> and uh, and Ken was saying, now, Mr. President, you haven't made an economic speech in quite a while. As a matter of fact, I haven't even heard one. You need to make an economic speech, a speech on economics. And the president, I remember the president saying, Ken, let me tell you about economic speeches. He says, President making an economic speech is like a fella peeing down his leg. It makes him feel warm, but nobody else knows what the hell he's doing. 
Anyhow, they were not, though nobody realized that, the best of friends for many years. Thomas would say, you know, I see you down there with Johnson all the time. He says, you better watch him. I'll tell you, really, now, Jack. And Johnson would say, now, you know, you better keep an eye on old Albert. Uh, you know why those Secret Service men were on the on the running board when Roosevelt went to Houston and Thomas was there. They didn't want Thomas to steal his watch. They were not. <laughs> oh, had, he had another bad habit. No, it was a good habit, but a bad habit. Johnson liked to tell stories. He was great to rock and tour. But why don't you start those damn stories about 3 o'clock on Saturday afternoon when everybody wants to go home? <laughs> you know, he hates to hate to go home and walk out, but you hate to miss him because he really was, uh, he had some good stories. Uh, I don't know, you, you must have heard the one about the guy from West Texas who scratched his leg on a uh, barbed wire fence and got to gangrene. Well, it began to hurt pretty bad and he went into, th this is Johnson telling the story and I, I'm gonna truncate it. Guy goes into a clinic in um, uh, Odessa West Texas. He said, uh, Doc, he said, the damn leg's giving me a problem. He said, uh, I never had anything like this before. Doc he said, he damn right never had anything like it before. He said, that's gangrene. He says, what's that? He said, that's an infection. It'll go through your whole system and kill you like that. Holy shit, are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. I said, well, what do you do about it? He says, I'll tell you, there's only one thing we do, amputate. He said, you mean cut it off? Yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, no, no, no. Well, he said, you know, I have another choice. You can die. So, okay, he goes through the operation. <laughs> He's now coming out of the anesthesia, and the first thing that comes into focus is the doctor. Well, doc, he said, how'd it go? Doctor says, Mac, I got some good news, and I got some bad news. He said, you son of a bitch, I know I shouldn't have come here. Where's my gun? I'll kill you. He said, well, go ahead, tell me the, um, tell me the bad news first. Well, he said, the bad news is this ain't the Mayo Clinic. And uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but we screwed up. We took off the wrong leg. He said, oh, you saw me again. What's the good news? He said, the good news is the other leg's going to be all right. <laughs> Several people asked me, what do you do as a consultant? And I am reminded of one of LBJ's uh, best pieces of humor and his story of what a consultant really is all about. So I use it. It is the story of uh, how in the spring of a particular year, little puppies were just all over Johnson City. Uh, they were in the flower beds. They were pooping uh, in the yards. Uh, they were running wild all around the town. Uh, the Johnson City Garden Club called a special meeting. Again, this is according to LBJ. Probably a mythical story, incidentally, but called a meeting of the uh, Garden Club. And um, the then elderly head of the Garden Club of Johnson City said, what are we going to do about all these puppies? So they are running our yards, they're running our flower beds, they're stinking up this place. Uh, I mean, this is unbelievable. The town's being overrun by puppies. and. Uh, Another elderly woman raised her hand and she said, uh, well, I know the problem, it's that big black dog. I think maybe big black bulldog. Uh, and she said, uh, that, that, that dog is responsible for all of these puppies just about in this town. So they voted unanimously to have the dog fixed. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the, uh, the uh, verb fixed here in the South, that's to have the dog castrated. Um, in any case, the next spring was arriving and the uh, women were so excited they did not expect any more puppies uh, to be running all over the city because they'd had the bulldog fixed. Well, spring came, there are puppies everywhere, more puppies, more puppies. So, I mean, they called an emergency meeting with the Johnson City Garden Club. The chairman once again said, what in the world are we going to do? So we've got more puppies here this spring than we did last year. The same elderly lady raised her hand. She said, it's still that GD black bulldog. And uh, they said, what do you mean it's that GD black bulldog? Uh, we had him fixed. 
And the little lady says, I know, but now he is acting as a consultant. We were at the end of the legislative session. We'd appropriated the money. and I got a call early one morning, and uh, my secretary said, President Johnson's on the phone. Of course, you'd always take that call immediately, and I did. And he said, well, I, ben, I guess that uh, in the, these little hot Texas summers, when the kids go out there to swim in that swimming pool and to see the grass and to see the trees, that they're going to say, uh, well, I wonder why that Ben Barnes in the Texas legislature didn't have enough sense to drill more than two water wells. He said, anybody knows that you got to have irrigation wells out here, and, you, and, and two wells will not irrigate this park. So in August, I guess they, they can put a sign on the state park out there. Ben Barnes would not drill enough water wells for the, uh, to have the water where the young Texas children can swim in the hot summers. And I said, well, Mr. President, the bill's already gone to the governor's office. We're, we're in the last day of the session. And he said, well, okay, I guess we can get the signs ready. He said, you know, I really thought that you could get things done. I've been, I've been your friend. I've been helping you. And he, he said, you know, I don't ask you for much, which not, was not necessarily the truth at that time. But he said, I just can't believe you can't do it. And lo and behold, there was a way that you could pass a joint resolution recalling a bill back from the governor's office if he had not already signed it. Well, Governor Smith had not signed the bill. So we got a joint resolution adopted, passed it through the Senate. I went over as Speaker. Even, I think I even spoke on the House floor, which I don't think the Lieutenant Governor had ever done for a, bill, or for a resolution or a bill. But anyway, we got it passed, got the bill back, put the money in there for, I don't know, seven, eight, or nine water wells, and, and, and got, got the, the LBJ Park to have an ample water supply where the children, when they go in July and August, in those hot Texas summers, are going to be able to see green grass and green trees and have water to swim in. And the president called me when it, when it was heard it's done. He said, well, I knew you could do it. Click. <laughs> Listen, when I wrote the, put, I didn't write it, but when I put together uh, Mrs. Johnson Sr., his mother's scrapbook about him, mm -hmm. And they had talked a publisher into paying us over $100,000 for uh, that book, just a copy of it. Uh, Bob Gutwindling, who was head of this publishing house, came to the White House uh, to present the president the first copy. And we went in there, and LBJ just praised him, and then he just went through the whole book line by line, correcting it here and there. <laughs> his own mother's scrapbook, and Bob got well, he just turned white. He thought that the president was going to make him rerun the whole thing. When I first went over to the White House, I hadn't been there but a few days, and there were a bunch of newly appointed federal judges in town. The president wanted to meet them, and they were in a place where we could, maybe in the Federal Judicial Center, we could reach them all at once. Seven or eight. And uh, so I called them. They came to the cabinet room. They were thrilled to death, of course. And I visited with them. And then as they were leaving, I tried to introduce them to the president. And uh, he gave them a little pep talk. He wasn't asking for anything. He was very good about that. And uh, so then there were pictures taken. He called me down in a couple of days and he showed me these pictures and said, you see anything wrong with these pictures? I said, well, I like nice pictures to me. He said, well, you're in every one of these pictures. <laughs> he said, do you really think that they came to get your picture? <laughs> I said, does that teach you anything at all? I said, oh, yes, it does. I understand that very easily. And as I was the only Greek American in Congress, I was invited to this reception. And I greeted the president, and the president said, uh, good, good to see you, or something like that. And he said, I was glad to see you got that defense contract in your district this week. Pause. And I'm sorry you couldn't be with me on the farm bill. <laughs> I thought, it's almost breathtaking uh, to appreciate the d degree to which uh, he was informed uh, on, on such matters. Uh, and when I was trying to explain what happened, 
and getting cut off from the president said, well, it sounds to me like you were scratching your ass when you should have been scratching your head. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> so, so that was my introduction really to, to the uh, front and center Lyndon Johnson. I'm uh, in, the, in his office at the ranch, and I'm standing there at his desk. And he said, uh, get a hold of, I, I don't know, remember who it was, and ask him and find out if such, 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 such. I don't remember. I don't remember the subject, and I don't remember who I called. But I do remember standing at his desk and saying, who had got hold of the president wants to know and he's standing there and he hangs up on the phone hangs up I look at him he said damn it tell him you're stupid don't tell him I'm stupid <laughs> yes sir he he was great at practical jokes with his staff uh, one time I remember in particular it was very embarrassing uh, we were at the ranch again for budget sessions, I think, and he had a bunch of congressmen down there and uh, for something else, but we overlapped. And, uh, so we're walking around outside the ranch and there are a bunch of concrete forms that were still wet. And OBJ had the idea, he says, why don't you guys write your names in it? Are we going to plant them here, some path somewhere? Said, that would be interesting. Every you know, the congressman had me do it. Well, my name is spelled with an E on the end, Schultz with an E, and I hadn't paid enough attention when I started to write and I got to the end of the form and I didn't have room for the E so I kind of left it. The LBJ's eagle eye looks down, he sees that, he turns to the congressman, you wonder why we got deficit problems when I hired a dumb son of a bitch who's so dumb he can't even spell his own name. <laughs> uh, I remember one time we were, we were um, flying off of the White House South Lawn and we had uh, three pads set up on the South Lawn so that three helicopters could come in at once and then go off. And we were getting ready to go on a major trip. And the passengers in Air Force One were gathered in the diplomatic reception room on the south side of the, of the White House. And they were all getting ready for this trip. And uh, as, the, as the time went on, well, we had assignments to all the people. We had them identified. Uh, when we called out the aircraft number coming in, um, they knew that they would come out and get on the helicopters and fly out to Air Force One, out at Andrews Air Force Base. Well, uh, the president had his assignment, of course, and he was in Hilo One. And I told the president that when his aircraft was on the ground, uh, I would come and get him. Because he was having a good time. He was in the diplomatic recep reception room glad handing all of the politicians and the people that were going to go with him on this trip. And uh, we were about two-thirds of the way through, and the president walks out of, of the uh, diplomatic reception room onto the South Lawn and starts heading for one of the helicopters. And uh, I went over and I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, Mr. President, uh, that's not your helicopter. And he looked at me and he said, Major, they're all my helicopters. And I said, yes, sir. He said, but you can tell me when the right one's in. Danny, who was all dressed up in his nice little neat uh, blue blazer and, and dark uh, flannel pants uh, and a little necktie and, and his hair brushed and everything, and he comes over and he pulls, quite literally pulls at the president's coat sleeve and uh, the president was busy in this conversation. He turns down, he sees this little kid. And he says, just a minute. And he turns back and keeps on with his conversation. A couple more minutes go by. And uh, Danny tugs again. And the president looks down. He says, well, I asked you to wait a minute. And a little bit gruff, you know. Uh, so... Another minute goes by, Danny pulls again. The president turns back to him and, and he says, Merry Christmas, Mr. President. And the expression on Johnson's face was just wonderful. He just beamed and he knelt down 
talk to Nanny for a couple of minutes. One day I came into the office and I'd had my hair done. The president said to me, today's a Wednesday, you don't have your hair done until Friday. What's going on? Again, typical LBJ, right? And I said, well, Mr. President, my parents are here and they're in town uh, for a convention or whatever they were here for, for two or three days. And so I had my hair done today. And he said, your, president, your parents are here, where are your parents? And I said, well, they're staying at the Washington Hilton. And two hours later, my mother called me and she said, Phyllis, we just had a knock on the door and we have an invitation to the reception after the White House dinner tomorrow night for President Tubman of Liberia. What am I going to wear? <laughs> she said, where's your father going to get a tuxedo? I said, I don't know, Mom, but we'll figure that all out. And unbeknownst to me, he had invited my parents to come, which, of course, was such an exciting moment for them because they didn't really know the president and first lady. And, and, uh, and of course, when they went through the receiving line, Mrs. Johnson said all those wonderful things that you say to mothers about their children. And it was a very, very special night. And, and in fact, when I told the one story that I remember and will always uh, uh, carry my affection for President Johnson to the grave as a result of was in uh, uh, December of 1968 when uh, he and we were lame ducks uh, and all of us uh, were trying to determine what we were going to do next in life. Uh, I had a, uh, 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 an overture from a large California law firm to uh, consider uh, opening a Washington office for him. And I sent a note in to President Johnson and uh, uh, told him that I would uh, like to go to Los Angeles, uh, uh, that I'd only be gone uh, uh, two days, but I'd like to go out and have a meeting with them. And uh, uh, as he always did with things that went into him in night reading, he would just check off and he checked off approved. Uh, and uh, off I went to Los Angeles. I was uh, meeting with the board of directors of the firm in their fine paneled uh, uh, conference room uh, when a uh, uh, secretary came in all a Twitter and uh, said, uh, uh, Mr. Pearson, uh, uh, the president is on the phone and says he really needs to talk to you uh, uh, right now. Well, the senior partners of this firm uh, said, look, we'll just clear out of this office and uh, uh, you use it as long as you need and, uh, and let us know when you're ready to resume the talk. Well, I was sure that he'd forgotten that I was in Los Angeles and had just uh, uh, called for me. Uh, and so I came on the phone and sure enough, the, uh, pr the president was on the line and um, I said, Mr. President, I'm, I'm not in Washington, I'm in Los Angeles. And he said, oh, I, I know that, I said, I know that. I remembered you were going out to Los Angeles. And I said, well then, Mr. President, uh, uh, what can I do for you? And he said, oh, I didn't have anything. I just thought the call might be helpful. He said, this is Lyndon Johnson, and I'm in Lubbock, Texas, and tonight I'm going to give a party up at the ranch for a fellow named Cantiflis. Uh, he's a, a Mexican entertainer. I said, yes, I know about Cantiflis. He's sort of the Will Rogers of, of, of Mexico. He said, well, I want you to get some people that would be, he'd be comfortable with. And uh, we, the cocktail party started at 7 o'clock, and we'll see you there. Click. So I spent part of the day gathering up people that I thought Cantiflas would be uh, comfortable with. I got the, the professor of Spanish at the University of Texas, the drama, uh, head of the drama department, and uh, people from the Mexican consul in Austin. And uh, there was a cocktail party, and it was very nice, and Contiflis was very polite, but you could see that he was just bored to death. And Johnson could see it too. So he disappeared for a while and came back with all of his ranch hands of Hispanic descent, and they're still in their work clothes with their, their wives and the kids, and Contiflis's eyes just lighted up as his brightest stars. Of course, he was a champion of the little man in Mexico. And it became a wonderful party, and everybody kind of melded together. After that uh, piece of legislation was passed, he uh, went and took the first pen and gave it to Everett Dirksen. 
And we got back into the car and I said, Daddy, there were all those civil rights leaders up there. Why, why didn't you give that first pen, that most important pen, to, to one of these great civil rights heroes? He looked at me again, shook his head, and said, you know, you don't get it, do you? No, I don't. And he said, because all those civil rights leaders were already for that legislation. I didn't have to do anything to convince them. It was Everett Dirksen making the courageous state that he did and stepping up to the plate like he did and bringing the people he brought with him that made the difference and made the, these civil rights leaders dream and my dream come true. That's why he got the first pen. I remember going in there uh, and Daddy introducing me, taking me in that door because he saw Senator Taft going in. And Senator Taft had cancer at that time and Daddy knew he was not going to live very long. And Daddy took me and introduced me to him and said, I want you to meet this great man. I want you to have the opportunity to say, I met Bob Taft. And um, he was very cognizant of, of history and how, even though at this age, um, I wasn't going to appreciate it, that maybe I would remember it. The, 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 the finest people of Sydney, about 300, were gathered in a room uh, to meet the president. And he was about an hour or two late, he was doing things. And he turned to me and he said, do I have to go in there? Oh, no, first he turned to uh, Marvin Watson. He said, Marvin, have I got to go in there? And he said, no, sir, you're the president of the United States and you go do anything you like. And he turned to me and said, what do you say? Mr. President, these people have been waiting now for about two hours. They're the finest people of Sydney society, and they're anxious to see you. And it would be a, a, a sad and perhaps unfortunate if, if you didn't uh, take advantage of this opportunity. So he said, um, he looked at me like, I'm going to get you. And he went in and, whoa, Mr. President, great. And a cheer went up in the room. And next thing you know, he's working his way through that room, shaking every single hand. And he comes out the other end, the finest people I ever met in my life. Why the greatest thing I ever did. So you see, you, you couldn't always depend on his mood because, uh, and, you, and he was. Uh, I remember one time he, uh, dealing with the Secret Service, he, he was going uh, over to some other department, probably the Pentagon, and uh, they'd set up the motorcade and had the Washington police and the Secret Service and everybody involved. And after about a block of this motorcade, he made the driver turn off, go on another street, go a different route, just left those motorcycle cops just out tooting around with, <laughs> with no president behind him. And, he's, and he, uh, this is a sort of a, uh, maybe a bad statement, but he's, he said, I get tired of, of all this business acting like I'm a Mexican general. <laughs> he, he hated the motorcycles and the sirens and all that stuff. The uh, son of the editor was that apparently there had been a story in the paper a day or so before in the Dallas Morning News that Lyndon Johnson was out raising a million dollars or more for a new house, a new home for the chancellor of the University of Texas. And the thrust of the story, according to Lyndon Johnson, was that he was doing this because he wanted to become the chancellor of the University of Texas. And he thought that was outrageous. He said, after all I've done for that young fellow, brought him down, showed him the park, that I'm honest I am about these things. And he looked at me and, he's, and uh, he said, uh, what in the hell, after all I've been through, what in the hell would I want to be the president or the chancellor of the University of Texas for? And I shrugged my shoulders and I said, yeah, I kind of agreed, why? And there's a long pause and then he said, and he pointed at me and he said, but if I wanted to be the chancellor of the University of Texas, I'd be the best one they ever had. But we got ready to go home and Johnson announced to the group that I want a photograph of this. He looked around for a photographer and there was not one there. Uh, 
I suspect he corrected that later. But he saw me with my camera and he says, can you make a picture of us, this group? And I said, sir, it hadn't gotten a film in it. I've used up all my film. He says, shoot it anyway. So he lines them all up, gets in the picture, they pose. I click my camera. There's not any film at all in my camera. And I suspect they ever, ever knew that, but they sure didn't get it. any copies of the pictures, I'll tell you. Uh, he was on a tapioca diet then, and uh, Miss Ladybird kept trying to to get him on diets because he was constantly gaining weight, and he was overweight. Uh, and so she would ration him. And so he'd get up in the middle of the night and eat more tapioca, and she heard him. She must have the ears of an Apache. She heard him, and she'd come in and ball him out and haul him back to bed. So one, one morning he calls Joe Layton and says, uh, the ladybird was, was, had heard him, it was a spoon clanking against the bowl, so uh, he asked Joe Layton to go buy him a wooden spoon. <laughs> he said, I suppose you think that if I pick up the paper now and I read about something that has been done on the basis of papers out there, that I will let you know about it. And I acknowledged that that thought had indeed occurred to me. And he said, well, if that ever happens, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out and I want you to sit on that hillside in front of the library and you look back at it and you think of all that we've been through to get this library open because it's been a long road. You think of all of that and then you come back in here and you call me because I'll be, I'll be waiting right here. I'll, I'll know what you're calling about and I'll be waiting for your phone. You get me on the phone and you say, Mr. President, because that's the way you talk. You're always very polite. You say, Mr. President, one of us is full of shit and let's decide right now who it is. No reporter in Washington or whoever covered the White House has ever had as much access to a president where you could walk down the street with him. Two or three times uh, he invited me into his limousine to take a ride to a certain place where he was going to speak and maybe the, my AP competitor also. I mean, I can assure you that never happened before and has never happened since. Of course, he did, he did not take kindly always to our reporting. Uh, and when he didn't, uh, he, was, uh, he let me know about it almost instantly. For all of his realism, which he never abandoned him, and for all of his uh, practicality, he was an idealist. I mean, he was, this was a man who believed you could end poverty, you know, how, how glorious. And, who um, believe you could end racism. You can't get more idealistic than that, <laughs> more wonderfully idealistic, but he always worked that in a very practical, <clears throat> hard-headed, realistic way. I think that commitment to civil rights is measured in the speech to the joint session of Congress in the spring of 65 after the march on Washington, after the march from Selma to Montgomery. And when the president in that speech came to the theme of the movement, and when he, standing in the well of the Congress, said, we shall overcome, that was it. That was an exhilarating moment. It was a, a vindication of so much of what we were trying to do and getting the attention of the American people. And here was the leader of the free world, the president of the United States, uttering with commitment and conviction, we shall overcome. I should never forget that. Uh, the president told me, he said, look, see, I'm gonna get this civil right bill passed, but I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna lose a lot of friends. And he say the country might go Republican. The South might go Republican. And he told me that. And I know one of his best friends, a senator from uh, Georgia, what is his name? Uh, Russell. 
Russell, that he used to come to the ranch all the time and hunt. Hunt season, Senator Russell come to the, to the ranch and hunt. Well, after that civil rights bill passed, I've never saw Senator Russell from that day to this. I, I think that one of the great memorials to Lyndon Johnson is here in Washington, on the, on the, really on the banks of the Potomac River, a, it's a, uh, a little forest that was planted with wonderful evergreens because he was evergreen. And the monument at the heart of it is a great slab of Texas granite. And I think that's the right monument for Lyndon, uh, Lyndon Johnson. Not a piece of polished marble, but a great slab of Texas granite.